bad. All right. Here last week, GM Grumpy come up with a pretty solid reason for a cumbrance and why we need to worry about it, deal with it, cope with it, how to utilize it, work it into your campaign. I followed it up with additional concepts and ideas, went a little different direction with it, gave it some depth. And the key thing there was, in case you missed it, just in case you missed it, was the majority of people, it's one of those first rules from typical rules heavy game systems that GMs and players chuck it to the side. We just take it and chuck it to the side because <laughs> we don't care, right? We don't want to worry about it. We don't want to bog down things, pull it down, slow down the action. We don't want all the extra dice rolls and so on and so forth. Although in defense, and I appreciate, you know, my friends and associates and fellow hobby enthusiasts such as Angel who pointed out that she doesn't particularly care for this topic of or to worry about encumbrance in her games because it has no bearing on her story and she's welcome to do that absolutely you're always as always that's the main thing to keep in mind with all game system rules they're only here as ideas and guidelines to give you something to work from if you choose or wish or want to incorporate that into your campaign or your game it's always been that way always 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 so that doesn't make it right or wrong we're not getting into one of them just those diatribe discussions on rules heavy or rule light or anything in between because frankly that's encumbrance right that shit we don't want to carry and we really don't want to know about right so we're going to chuck it pitch it throw it out the window who cares but and there's always the big but fat man with his butts the big ones keep in mind that encumbrance is just one of many of these early discarded rules that seem to become less and less prevalent in more and the more modern updated game systems or the game systems that are considered rules like because it's not in the eyes of the players or the GMs a necessary thing to worry about they don't want to worry about it they don't want to keep track they don't want to play the account and we don't want to keep score that's fine so well, it's hard to quantify is an encumbrance the first one to go or the second one or the tenth one to go uh, how do you, you rank these by number i don't think you can it's a matter of preference spread out and i think at some point it comes up whether you dwell on it or not whether you keep ha hyper accurate paperwork on it or not or you just cope with it on the occasional occasional situation where something's reared up where you kind of have to figure out how to address a particular problem for a player character or something in in game okay so for me the next topic or the next subject of this particular thing would be uh, substance food water starvation right now most players most most player characters when they go into town they go to the tavern they go to the inn they, they pony up some silver or some gold, even some gold maybe, the lavish feasts and meals and things like that. The uh, traditional go-to's go to pack so, such and such amount of weeks of iron rations into your pack. You know, let's ignore the encumbrance concepts about, well, gee, I don't know, iron rations about 90 gold pieces in weight. So per week, if I'm carrying two weeks, now I've got 180 pounds, uh, or 180 gold pieces of poundage, roughly 5 pounds, 10 pounds, something like that. If you're packing regular food, a meal for a, a one person per day, for a standard size human per day, uh, used to be 200 gold pieces or something of that, uh, in weight, something to that effect, uh, 6, 7 pounds. 6, 7 pounds is uh, enough to sustain you for a week or roughly two pounds a day or a little less than two pounds a day no big deal uh, the same thing goes with water in the real world we know that a human being cannot go more than three days without water of some sort from some source that's potable because they're going to start having physical problems their body's going to start shutting down 
and eventually it's going to kill them. The lack of water will kill you. You know it, I know it, everybody knows it. This also holds true to the games. This is one of those reasons in the early days they included those sets of rules, or at least made a pass at them, to take into account things like this. Same thing goes with the food. The average human being can go X amount of days, some will argue a week, some will argue two weeks, before they start suffering significant health issues from the lack of nourishment. Of course, everybody will make that statement, well, we can just forage as we go. Absolutely true. There's a reason why, there's a reason why there's skills for survival. There's skills, or used to be skills for starting a fire, used to be skills for camping, used to be skills for hunting and fishing, and in some cases they're still there in certain versions where they've been lumped together into a proficiency skill that covers several, several different things in that venue. This is also one of the reasons why having a ranger in the party, having a druid in the party was always a, a great bonus or a boon because they could worry about certain things that the rest of the party could just do a wink and a nod at, you know. <laughs> Austin's over here has got us covered. <laughs> we don't have to worry about starving. Oh, we're never going to starve. Yeah, okay. You know, we can pick fruits and berries and, and grass and plant life all day long unless they're poisonous, or in the process of cooking them make them poisonous, or not cooking them makes them... You see, there's there's reason why they had those skill sets. And your characters could develop, the player characters could develop the skill sets to survive, and not just survive, but thrive in the wild, in the wilderness, away from the store, if you will. Now, there's also and I haven't got to it, I know you're thinking it, the first thing y'all to most of you going, oh, but we got magic. We have magic. We have magic. And we have prayer. We have those valuable little knick, little knit-knack things that our, our spellcasters of various denominations and types can utilize to keep themselves nourished and, and in, some, in many cases keep the party nourished. The most common is a clerical spell that says purify food and water. Or that means you can take pretty much anything that's that's considered edible, no matter how bad a shape it is, how old it is, how nasty it is, and they can turn it into something that's, pa that's palatable and potable. And there's some magic spells, a couple of them, and I went and did some research. I spent the last two weeks, why well, didn't just jump into this video? I, I did a little bit of research. Yeah, guys, I got the books out, and I got some several of my GM guys out, and I went through, and I noticed from my AD&D version, my 2.0 to my 3.5, things have changed considerably. There was some changes in the magic and there was some changes in uh, the skills. And there were changes in other things of this nature. In part because probably the lion's share of people, this is one of those chunky, clunky, uncomfortable sets of rules that get chunked to the side. We're going to pitch them out the world. This is why I hear people complaining about chunky and clunky, you know, game rules. I think first thing that comes to my mind is that they're just too chunky for you to deal with. You don't want to cope with it because it's, you don't want to be inconvenienced. Or, dare I say, dare I say, oh, no, no, better not say it because, you know, there's always somebody that's going to go, mm, you so, you so and so. You're lazy. You're a lazy GM, you want to be a lazy GM, you don't want to be bothered with doing your due vigilance and your homework and thinking outside the box. You don't want that to slow down your, your story. You want it to, to make the game go fly, uh, fly faster. Awesome sauce, man, because that's what it's about, right? All great and dandy. Even though I still say you're missing out on the boat. And I don't care how elaborate or how simple your storyline goes, someplace, some point, somewhere, you're going to ask somebody to make a save, toss a dice, or something that relates to these topics. Now, we've just bypassed all the need for all the funky chunky, rules heavy, extra splat books and source books and money books and chrono books and whatever that you don't want and don't need and don't uh, ever intend to pick up and read. Great. Fine. 
Yeah, because that's also how we play, right? It's all part of the rules. We don't need the rule. We don't want the rule. We don't have to use the rule. But some of us want them. Some of us like to have them. And for no other reason, because it gives us a foundation to work on in those stories, in those games where we don't have to bog the game down because with, with a whole bunch of unnecessary paperwork. But we know in our back of our heads as a GM, as a well-educated, well-studied GM, as Rob Gusterson puts it, the wizards love their books. Most GMs love their books, too. I'm not saying it's right or wrong that you're not one of those people who have a bookcase full of stuff. You don't need to be the academic GM. There's plenty of us who do that. <laughs> I'm just saying, you don't need to be. It's not necessary. Once again, not part of the game. It's not insistent. It's not what you absolutely have to do to play the game. You don't have to think inside the box. You don't have to break the box. You can make a circle. You can make a, you know, whatever you want as long as you and your friends and your, and your party at the table are enjoying themselves and having fun. That's always been the main thing about all this stuff, right? You betcha. Meanwhile, okay, so we have mundane things like skills. We have mundane, you know, we have people who have proficiencies and feats. We have entire classes, in the case of the ranger and the druid, who are geared towards survival in the wilderness, keeping themselves alive and ideally the group that's with them alive. And yet, we often don't allow these characters or their players to fully utilize those skill sets, those special abilities, those unique things that make them up, that make them out to be what they are. What is a ranger? What is a druid? If you don't allow them to you know, utilize that on occasion, are you doing them justice? Even if it's just story-based, you should still allow them to utilize their character for, for what the character is intended for, or partially intended for the base piece or cornerstone of these two character classes. Now, let's talk about that magic again for a minute. Look at that. Wink and a nod thing. Yeah. Wink and a nod, right? Okay. My party's out in the wilderness. Been out in there for, you know, two weeks, three weeks. You know, a fortnight. We've been all the road for a fortnight. And it's been dry and dusty, and, 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 and there's no, no, not a drop to drink in the sight. Thank God for Felipe Flopas of the, the third over here, our clerk, because they can produce water with a, with a prayer. Mm. Right. A uses up a spell slot or a prayer slot. They got to do that every day. There's one less that they have available for what? Whatever might come up. It's pointing out. But is that a clunky rule? Is that something you want to wink and nod and check out? Or is that a valid reason thing to keep track of? If, if I got a, if I got somebody who has a spell, you know, is is casting a spell to keep the group you know, in health, healthy conditions, is not an imperative important thing. So they're going to utilize that spell slot every day. They're going to memorize that spell. They're going to pray for that spell every day. So that's one less that they can utilize for other stuff. Not on the table, right? You could sweep it off the table if it's not convenient for you. I mean, I'll be the last person to say you can't because that's what this is about, right? Everybody has that that option. Then there's the other magic. I did a significant amount of cursing and muttering to myself and annoying my wife who looked at me like I'd lost my mind as I went through quite a few different books, spell compendiums, uh, treasure books, so on and so forth, and I know they're there, I don't know which versions they're in, but there used to be a spoon of gruel or a bowl of gruel that would produce X amount of gruel every day and would sustain a party. It was nourishing, but it was bland. There was no flavor or necessarily this, that, and the other thing, but it was a magical artifact of some sort. Uh, I thought it was named after some some monk or, or, or monastery priest or whatever, and anyway. Uh, then there was one or two other magical odds and entities, and then there's the the major one that everybody's pretty much familiar with, but probably don't utilize that much. It's the ring, the ring of substance. Familiar with the ring of substance? Actually, the ring of substance is a very handy tool, especially for people who need to do a lot of things like study. So your wizards and your priests and 
a number of other specialists would utilize these rings quite effectively because it reduces your need for sleep, allows you to do a lot of more, a lot of things other than just keep yourself alive. So it's going to magically replace, it's basically a magical IV. But you've worn it for a better part of a week or two, I think it's a week I read, uh, then you do not have to worry about food and water. The ring will sustain you indefinitely until it's removed. Everybody wants one. It's like everybody wants a ring of protection. Well, we're back to that. There must be entire wizard academies out there. First level, zero level wizards and first level apprentice wizards who spend half their days enchanting gobs and gobs and gobs of low level magic items and magic weapons. Sheer lunatic amount in some people's campaigns. Varies on the worlds, right? Anyway. So everybody in the party, just like everybody wants a bag of holding, everybody wants rings of protection if they can get it, but well, why not get a ring of substance? And that's fine. I never cared for it. I always chose, preferred, to make my, my players, to at least some minor degree, be accountable for their own personal upkeep. Now, Another one of those sections, and this is this kind of, it's not really pertinent to this topic, but it, it's in the back of this change. If I want, and I look in the back of the GM guide for 3.0, I, I can't speak for 4 or 5 because I never bothered to look for it at the time, and I don't have copies of those, and I don't really want to buy them. Uh, my second 2.0, my second edition, has a bunch of stuff on the topic of hirelings, hiring people. Everything from mercenaries to people to, to, to take care of your lands or, or staff your castle if you acquire one and so on and so forth. Uh, how to pay for their upkeep. And somewhere in there, it, it gives you a, a monetary value of how many gold pieces per month this person's upkeep should take. So if you figure, you know, what's uh, the average meal, 30, uh, 30 silver pieces. So if you spend a gold piece or two gold pieces a day for, for room and board, well then, ideally, each character has a minimum upkeep of, say, 60 to 60, 62 to and up gold pieces per month for basic accommodations and food and, and, and supplies, okay? That's the easiest, simplest way to keep track of some things without going overboard and to cover that base, the majority of it. The average individual is going to, pay, to pony up this much every month for their upkeep. But, and, and it's just do it in one lump, and then we can do a, a, weed and a, a wink and a nod whenever it comes up. That's a good way to take care of it. There are other ways too. Now, there are times, and uh, and and then, or but, hey, why not another but? Let's toss another but in there because you know what? We're gonna do that. We got ourselves a little bit of time to kill yet. Play off the pop. This is terrible stuff. Very bad. I've got a bad habit. I picked it back up again. I, I managed to break. I managed to break myself of this, and now I'm back at it. So, terrible habit. Too many empty calories. Yeah. Them call the time in for a reason, right? It's all about substance. All right. So sometimes it's just like encumbrance. But you got a little bit more play with the, when it comes to the substance. I can find myself in a scenario where I planned a great adventure and my characters went through it and they went through a lickety split. And as a matter of fact, perhaps they went through it too fast. Or maybe they went something went south and we all ended up going north instead of south. And suddenly I'm in uh, unknown territory with, without a whole lot of stuff prepared and I got a fire from the hip. Or, perhaps, the party has been very successful, got themselves loaded down with loot, far more than their encumbrance should ever allow them to lug, lug around, and now they're trying to head their way back to town. So, it takes much longer for them to get cover that same ground. What if that ground is a rocky mountainous area, or a desert? There's many different types of deserts. And I've been out in the woods, for quite a while, uh, periods of week, some periods of time, and you go out there and you didn't bring some water with you, you might find yourself wishing you had. 
because my, you might think that the mountain streams and woodland creeks are everywhere and then some. Not necessarily true. You can go quite a ways, and then you might find one, and you might be wondering where that priest at, so they can come purify that murky looking water before you put it in your mouth. How desperate are you? And there's a, are there cause and effects of that? But in and of itself, this can turn into an adventure of its own making. Either a moral adventure, one of them morals things where you learn a lesson, a life lesson about operating in the woods, you know, uh, learning how to survive or just surviving a bad case scenario, gone bad, you know, something that's gone bad, or we find ourselves dealing with terrible weather or some reason or another, but there's opportunities in this sort of thing. Uh, did we bring enough supplies? What happens when the supplies run out and you get stuck? Well, ask the Donner Party what happened. If anybody knows American history and don't know what that one's about, it's a possible thing, right? One of these nice little splat books or whatever y'all want to call them these days, nice little source book for 2.0 is the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Wilderness Survival Guide. There's a companion book called The Dungeoneers uh, survival guide, which I have. I have. You know, your mustache there, right? This is a very nice thing to have. First off, it's not packed with a bunch of damn charts, rules, and addendums and stuff. Somebody argue, well, it doesn't work for 5.0 or Pathfinder or whatever. Doesn't have it that way. Mostly for those story read based people. You know, we've got a lot of information explaining why things do things and how things might turn out. And then we have basic things. So, for example, this is a foraging chart. And what it just does is tell you what are you, uh, what's the odds in the wintertime in an Arctic environment, what's the odds of finding a medium-sized animal? Zero slash zero. You've got a zero chance of finding a medium-sized animal in the middle of an Arctic winter because they just aren't out there. You have a greater chance of finding some small animal, a really big animal. The medium-sized ones, not so much. Now in the spring and summer, that increases. But that's what that chart is, and most of those charts are set up that way. They're not about giving you a statistic or a dice modifier or a roll. It's just giving you some averages or whatever, so you got an idea of how to play it as a GM. I have had a couple really successful, started out as some pretty lame adventures. The adventures didn't turn out the way we had planned, the way I'd worked them out, because the players really went off script, or it just took a turn for the worst. And instead of just tossing the game up and tearing everything up and saying, let's go grab the Nintendo, remember Nintendo? Right, just get the Nintendo out, knock out a few a few hours that way. I decided to fire from the hip per se, and have them play it out. You, your the axle on your treasure wagon has broke, and one of the four, of your four horse team has been killed by a goblin, or what have you, and now you're in the middle of a rocky, hilly area with couple hundred leagues to go between you and the nearest main town. What do you do? How are you going to get there? You going to abandon that wagon? What you, how are you going to keep them horses alive? How are you going to keep yourselves alive? You, you figure it's going to take you, took you a week and a half to get there. It's going to take you five weeks to get back. Well, we all, we all are guilty of that wink and a nod instant transportation where, oh, we left town and blah, 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 we can have later. You're there at the adventure site. Right, and we all can do that. The rules allow, and you're entitled to do it. Speeds things up, great, no problem. Not advocating not to do that, or that you have to or must in any way whatsoever. Just pointing out, there are options. Getting home, on the other hand, if it takes three times longer to get home, perhaps there's good reason for that, and if there is, why not play it out? Why not take it out and give those characters a reason to stretch those skills, work out those proficiencies, allow for that one or two specialty characters to shine in an, oper in an, in an environment situation, a mini adventure that's right up their alley. So if the, the trail rations are running out, 
time to start hunting. Starting time to start fishing. You gonna trap for some food? Well, all that takes time. You know, I'll never talk about we're just gonna walk along and pop, you know, we're gonna shoot whatever game we see. Well, okay, we can make it, you know, we're gonna treat that like a regular encounter. Maybe you find something, maybe you don't. Maybe you'll see some edible food, uh, plant vegetable, vegetables or plant life, or maybe you won't. But if you're gonna forage, if you're gonna fish, if you're gonna hunt, and you've got skills, you don't have skills. This tells you how to operate in both cases, right? How to how to take advantage of that. Uh, if you got a character who's right up their alley, well, how much food can they bring down? How much, you know, if you bring down a, a deer, how many pound, how much poundage on average is that between somebody who knows how to cut and draw and 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 dress a carcass and somebody who doesn't? Well, in this case. This little book will give you that information, or you can do your Google research on it and find out that you know uh, you can get the choice in a, in a hurry. You can get the choice bits and pieces out of a deer and get five or ten pounds of, uh, of high protein meat that, for a day or two, as long as the weather doesn't turn up funky real fast, uh, or you you still got that priest can take that funky meat and turn it into edible meat, uh, keeps the party on the road for a couple days. You don't need to stop the next day or two to, to forage for more unless the opportunity presents itself. And don't forget, if you go this route, experience, experience, experience. Experience points come in many, many forms and many ways of gaining them. I've played with GMs who were very miserly in that aspect. If you didn't involve killing a bad guy somehow or another, there was an experience. You know, if you're overcoming an obstacle, that goes above and beyond the average everyday thing, that's an experience point of some kind. There's some value to that, right? I'm just saying. Okay, I'm just saying. What do I know, right? I'm not as articulated and as brainy and as well as well read as others are, although I'm telling you right now, I've read every lick of the stuff I have several times over in my lifetime. Rather than that, it always comes up and clicks when I need it. You know, that's because of age and what have you. A lot of years of substances I probably shouldn't have considered. Anyway, it's there. They're there for a reason. Or not. Like I've said, I've noticed that the later versions have started to do away with this stuff. But this is just one more set of rules that we don't, we can do a wink and a nod, you know. <laughs> Or we can, you know, what happens when you that doesn't work and that doesn't work and that doesn't work? Instead of just going, um, 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 uh, you're back in town, or um, 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 Begeldab Dubdigi, the the deity of so and so comes down and saves you. Play it out. Have a mini adventure. Give these players an opportunity to stretch into a different realm that doesn't involve necessarily hacking and slashing their way to, to, survive, uh, to, the, to a con happy conclusion. Also could be a good a good way to loosen the load, so to speak, when we're dealing with that encumbrance problem, right? Right on! Hey! Until the next one. And I got another one in mind. We'll get to that one. I challenge y'all to do a video and tell me. Tell the rest of us. What are these clunky, chunky chunk to the side rules in these so-called rules heavy games are not valuable and have no point and are not useful in your campaign. Till next time, game on.